Hear the word of the Lord. From John chapter 9. Now I want to tell you about an unconventional way. If you think that we are unconventional, you try to follow Jesus a moment. And this is, listen to what he does. It's the most preposterous. It's the most unsanitary. It is a thing that you can't do this. But Jesus said, I can do what I want to. And here is what he said. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi. His disciples asked him, who did sin? Was it this poor man or was it his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus said. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. We must carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and when no one can work. But while I am here in this world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit, he didn't spit, he spit on the ground. When you see that dirt, you'll know what I'm talking about. You call it holy ground, it is, but it's dirty ground. And he took that dirt and, and got a big wad of it over and over again and spit and spit in that hand. Not just a little bit, big spit. And he took that mud, it's what the scripture says right here, and smeared it, spread it, spread it all over the blind man's eyes. He told him, you go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means S-E-N-T, sent. He sent him there. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. And his neighbors and others who knew him said, isn't this the man who used to sit there and beg. And some said he was, and others said, well, he looked like him, but I doubt if it is. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. And they asked him, who healed you? What happened? And he told them, this man, they called Jesus, made some mud and spread it over my eyes and told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam and I went and I washed and I was blind, but now I see. But who was he? I don't know who he was. I just know that I was blind but now I can see. Now, unconventional, this is unconventional. UNC and Duke, Capria Valley would frown on it. Um, but I'm going to tell you what I think God wants to do for you today. And I want you to be seated. I do thank you so much. I am not going to say if you need healing, as others have said. I'm going to say when you need healing. Because you are going to need healing if you stay in this world long enough. Now I had one friend who was almost 75 years old before he ever took an aspirin. 
but later he needed something from God. You're in this world and you're subject to different sicknesses. You can say, not me, nothing's wrong with me. I walk and nothing hits me. Just wait. Everybody is subject to the sinful things that have happened and the curse that hit this world. When you're walking into this place, I wish you could see it now. I like to go there because it is where he did that miracle that was so unconventional. And for people who believe that you've got to be conventional every time, Jesus was the norm. You go down this steep way from the Mount of Olives, get down to the very bottom and you see a little concrete house right there. Then you go through a gate, hang on to this one, called the Dung Gate. That's what they call it. You go there through that Dung Gate and behind that, there's another little building or two, and you look to the right and you see the Mount of Olives. You look to the left and you see the Mount Zion. And you see a little village called Silwan, a little Arab village it is today. Right there is the pool of Siloam. Dirty, banky, crawling with all kinds of, uh, of bacteria, I'm sure. Jesus said, go and wash your face and your eyes off what I put. I want you to watch the secret and how it comes. He said, go wash. And the man didn't say, they're going to laugh at me. I'm scared. The man, sick of being blind. He's never seen his mom and daddy and never seen his wife or his children. He's never seen one bird flying in the air or one flower. He simply goes and does what he wants, what he tells him to do. Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. The year is 20 8 or 29 A.D. He is blind from his birth. There are people who are picking at him and they like to do this when it comes to Christianity. They know how to write letters and they know how to write articles about you and make fun of you. If I had been there, I would never have forgotten what he did when he spit and made the mud pack and rubbed it all over his eyes and sent him away. It is a story, an episode, not a story, about how Christ heals and maybe even what he wants to do today. And he uses something else that is so different. He uses the words of his disciples first. One disciple. It didn't say every one of his disciples. But one of the disciples looked at him and said, Rabbi, as they are traveling into town, going for the worship service around. Rabbi, who sinned of this poor man or his parents that he is like this. They revealed what they had to have changed in their lives. Now, I don't know what you hung up on about this thing called the power of God. But I know that some of you are all hung up on it and you're scared of it. You're scared that you're going to have to do something 
And God's going to make a fool out of you. God's not going to ever make a fool out of you. But you're going to be a testimony unto him. I don't know if he ever really gave an answer to the poor disciple who blurted out, who sinned? You, did you catch the connection? I want to ask you. Say amen if you did. You make a conclusion right there that if the man is sitting there begging and if the man is sitting there blind, that he is full of sin. It's not just a nice thing there. He's sinful. That was the prevailing mood of the people when Jesus came. That if anything was wrong with you, you sinned. And if you didn't sin, your parents sinned in front of you. Well, how in the world would you know that? Dr. Berkeley gives you three or four beliefs that they had at the time. William Berkeley. First of all, he said that they had a pagan belief when Jesus was there 2,000 years ago in AD 29 of reincarnation. Now, you know that because some of you have seen books that are written. Don't read them. I myself have had to deal with people who were reincarnation people who have come right up in the service and who named different people always going back to the Bible days. Named me. And it took me four hours one day sitting in my office with 12 women to say, you cannot believe this and be godly. And God straightened it out. I want you to know. It was not easy. You'd say, you mean you do that? I straightened it out. The Lord straightened it out through me. Because my man that I, my mentor, was not even a Pentecostal holiness man. He was a black man from South Carolina who lived in Harlem and had a church called the Soul Saving Station. It was Jesse. And Jesse looked at me one day in Haiti and said, Hedgepath, you're going to have to deal with that. I said, blah, 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 blah. let somebody else deal with it. Let the deacon board deal with it. Let the staff deal with it. Let an evangelist deal with it. He said, you got to deal with it because you're the pastor. Boy. And I had to deal with that kind of thing. One was a little girl by the fire. One was one of the two witnesses in Revelation. Incidentally, that was Jerry B. Walker, according to what she said. And the other one was herself. And many others, including me, and she gave me a really nice person to be like, and that was somebody that I'm not I couldn't even begin to be like him, the Apostle Paul. And the stuff that came out because of their belief was horrible. And we had to deal with it. And I finally said to her, you either recant today or I will expose you before the whole congregation on Sunday morning. <laughs> and she dropped it. And today she's still saved. And all of them straightened out. I could tell you more, but I will not. That is what was going on in Jesus' day. This thing called reincarnation. And they believe that in it, that sickness listen, could have been caused by a sin that you committed when you were somebody else. 
500 years ago. That's how deadly Edgar Cayce is and some of the others who write about it. And damnable, I'll say. The second thing was they believed, according to Barclay, that heredity had a great part in it and that the sins, listen, that the sins of the father and the mother, you recall setting this, would be in you how many generations? Down to two and three generations on beyond you. That what my great great grandfather did that I may be paying for now with a toothache or a headache or a backache. Don't you believe anything like that. The third thing was, I wish I had time to just nail a lot of these, but I only have so much to drive toward the point. The third thing was that devout Jews, they were devoted, they were devout. It was about devout for them. They believed that the sins of Adam uh, was, were carried on down, and I do believe that this happens. As we stated in the very beginning, there are things that were set in motion that they did not have in the Garden of Eden and we would not have had had they not bit that fruit, whatever it was. That's the third thing, the only four. In Jesus' day when he got there, there were some Jewish rabbis, this is the most preposterous, unbelievable ones, I think. The Jewish rabbis, actually Jewish rabbis, did you understand that? That veered far, far, far from the word of God. The Jewish rabbis believe that a child in the womb of a woman could actually commit a sin, Barclay says. That while you, if anyone is carrying a child now, that that child is capable of carrying a sin. And consequently, they would say, who sinned, this man or his mama and his daddy? There are the four things, the four reasons why they would think something like this. Now, it was the mud in the eye that caught everybody's attention of this disciple that happened when Jesus stopped and spit and rubbed, it looked like some kind of mud makeup or mud pack or something on his, on his eyes. And he said, and he says right now, hear me plainly and clearly. He says, neither did this man sin, nor did his mama and daddy sin, but for the glory of God that is in his holy place. I want you to say it with me. Blessed be the name, come on, of the Lord. God wants to hear you talk. Let's understand that life on this earth is not very fair. You say, tell me about it. I'm going to. Why is a child born blind? Why is a child born with one arm? Why is a child born with all kinds of illnesses that follow them throughout life and we cry about it? Why? It'll take somebody else that's smarter than we are to understand why these things happen. Why is it that a man and a woman can raise a child to be so perfect, send him off to school and let him make 4.0 and then let him come up and commit murder and be in jail for the rest of his life? You said that happened? Yes, several times, one recently. You see, it's not that anybody has sinned that did this. And 
there is no doctor, there is no, there is no teacher, no philosopher, no preacher, no evangelist, no pastor, no anyone who can see all of these things that are happening. We have no dictionary for this type of thing. And if you are one, I'm clear about this. Mark me down, Sister Attorney. I am clear if you are one of those or if I am one that says, messed up, didn't he? God just laid it on him, boy, zapped him, zapped him. You're just showing how big a fool that I am. I know why you're in this bed today in the High Smith Hospital, a woman said, who claimed to be visiting for me. I'm not making this stuff up. You understand? I'm telling you the truth. Listen to me. Stood there at the bed and said, I came to visit for pastor. She did not. This is why we ask you, if you're going to visit, you visit. But if you're going to visit for us, we want to stamp it. Because what you say there comes back to us. And it came back. She said, you know, the Lord just told me that if you hadn't sinned, you wouldn't be in this bed like you are. Ooh. They called me at the hospital, the old Highsmith Hospital, and asked me about it. It was very embarrassing. And I had to tell them the truth. Jesus said, don't get wrapped up in what others are thinking about this. It's so that the glory of God can be revealed. And there are some of you who are having problems. Your wife is having a problem. Or your child is having a problem. And you are browbeating yourself to death. You're saying, God, why did he go astray? I wish I hadn't gone with that woman back yonder. No, she is. I wish I hadn't gone. He doesn't do things like this. God is not a vindictive person. Your sins are forgiven. They are washed away and forgotten. They are thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. And God puts a sign out there, no fishing from you or from me. Can I get a witness from somebody? Tell sister, the pastor's wife over there, that she's got this backache because of sin in her life. You're talking about a jaw jacking. Stupid. Don't get into that. You're not God. If there's something wrong with you today, it's not from something that you have done. It's not from some offense that you've made towards someone else. It's not because you had an abortion. It's not because you slept with somebody else. It's not because you did thus and so. God doesn't visit you with that kind of thing, I'm telling you. God forgives you so that you can go free in life and be totally free from every sin that you've ever... Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm free. I don't want to hear you say it. Come on, I'm free. I'm born again. It means born again means that you're a different person. When God got ready to do something, he did it different. As a matter of fact, I picked out, just for the love of it, three. I'll do it three. I've got time for that. Three people who had an illness, and Jesus healed all of them. But doctor, Ashley, Sandra, you girls, you guys, he didn't heal the same person. He didn't heal the next person the same way he did the other one. We, we are so tr traditional. But he did the way I saw Mrs. Pearl in, in the church, and she was uh, rolling in the floor, and that's the way she got the Holy Ghost. So I got a roll. You don't have to do anything. 
I think the only way I can get it is because I got it a certain way. You, you don't have to do that. He's a mysterious, I started to say mischievous. I think sometimes he may be a mysterious God who, who does things, I believe, just to, just to get a laugh in heaven. How many times has he laughed at me when I said, I got to do them the same way, bap. By the way, tradition, if I'm not mistaken, tradition is the same thing as a grave without a front and a back knocked out. Tradition will kill you and bury you. You can follow order, but you do not have to be a traditionalist. It will kill you. Jesus wouldn't even let Peter, James, and John up at the, up at the uh, when, when they came down on Transfiguration up there. They said, let's build a tabernacle. Oh, no, let's build three tabernacles. One for you and one for Elijah and one for Moses. No, Jesus said, he's got something in mind. I don't want you to be a traditionalist. I don't want you to be a man of, of, of worship of the, of the building or anything. I'm a spirit. I'm a spirit and they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. So in Mark chapter 10, He didn't need a pool. I don't know why he needed a pool. Why did he need a pool called Scent? And by the way, when you go there, you'll spell it S, how you spell it? S-C-E-N-T, Scent. <laughs> he didn't even have a pool this time. And the character's name is Bart. Bartimaeus. Down where the cats jumped up on that table, I, I wish you could have been there. When we ate the fat and drank the sweet and we ate the fat of the rams, I wish you could have been there. Jericho and the cats, when we got there, the cats jumped up on the table and started eating. That's when we used to go to some really, un, when the first days we really went to some places. Jesus! Who's that? Shut him up. He's disturbing the service. Jesus said, wait a minute, I hear him. I hear what? Jesus, son of David, son of man. Have mercy on me. And nothing stopped him any quicker than somebody in need. He said, bring him to me. And they brought the man to Jesus. And he just said, receive your sight. No mud. No pool. No visine. No restasis. No murine. No salty water or whatever it is you put on. You know, salty water goes in the mouth on it and up the nose. None of that. Bart goes away healed. Got to get it next time the same way. I got to do it the same way. And the next time was in Mark chapter 8. It's a story of a healing of a... I'm, I'm just on to the blind people right now. I think there's some blindness in the crowd and some blindness in my family that's happened. And I, I guess this is why I'm at it. Okay, listen, just for a moment more. There's a man in Mark chapter 8 at Bethsaida. Now, that's in my kind of place and phase. It's called Galilee. It's the most gorgeous place. You go there, you're going to want to go there and stay and ride on that Sea of Galilee and have church on it. This is a beautiful place. The man is blind. And Jesus took, listen, unconventional. Jesus said, come here. Got him away from everybody. And Jesus said, let's take a little walk. Now let's have a, let's a little walk with Jesus. Let's, let's talk, I know, but he walks him out of town. Is he chicken-hearted? Is he scared? Well, no. He's just unconventional. He walks him out of town and says, and just lays his hand, speaks to him like that. He says, what you got? The man said, I, I see something. I, I see men as trees. Well, men on oak trees and cedar trees and palm trees, let's do it again. 
Jesus, you're not Jesus. You're not godly if you do it again. Who started that? Who on earth told me that? He said, if you do it more than once, you're not godly. <laughs> Jesus prayed again and said, receive your sight. There's nothing wrong with praying again. Might be good to pray again. And the man said, I can see. I can see. Now, I'm not going into depth, in depth with any of these. I wanted to go in depth with the man about the woman and everything, you know, but uh, the mama and daddy sent him, but I, I can't. About the people's attitude that day. But let me go now. Uh, he saw another one in Mark chapter 8. If I didn't get it right, if I got it wrong, that's Bethsaida, okay. And then he saw Bartimaeus. And then I got six more pages here that I need to get to in here. Let's see. He, he blessed all three of these men and gave them sight, but didn't do any one of them the same way. Sometimes it's the unconventional. I wanted to tell you that the most outstanding miracle that ever came from God when I prayed for somebody. I wish it happened all the time. I'm traditional. I've done it the same way, it didn't work. When I went into the Duke Hospital, I've told you, and the woman was lying there and her belly was this big and they had said she won't live over a day. She's got ovarian cancer. Is that pretty strong stuff? Ovarian cancer, it's pretty deadly, isn't it? Isn't it, Steve? You've seen a lot of that, Eileen. Look. And I just prayed, and something spoke to me and said, plead the blood of Jesus. Plead it again seven times. Seven times, and I walked out, and I said, it's yours, God. Met Billy and Flo Wellens coming in. They said, what you doing? I said, I don't know, but I'm on the way home. Didn't stop and talk to them. Wasn't rude. I just said, I got to go. It's late now, and I got to go. Got church tomorrow. The doctor came in and said, it's a miracle. Called her brothers and said, it's a miracle. Now, it was such an unconventional way for me, but I have tried it since then. Sometimes it works, but most of the time it doesn't. Because I think that I'm being too conventional in it. Thinking that that's the way God has got to work. And you can't tell God how to work, sir. Now you who are medical can do it and do it the same way. And sometimes that works too, doesn't it? And sometimes it doesn't. When God starts to heal you, expect whatever he wants to give you. I don't have any clever words. I don't have anything that would, would tell you if you need healing, do these things. I got books on them. There was something different about every one of these miracles. But I found the one common denominator in the three. And it's what I'm ending with. Okay? Here it is. No pool, a pool. No spit, no mud, no visine, no one. No walking like trees, no doing it, not, not touching, not doing anything. I, I, I see these things happening, okay? And I said, well, Lord, what made it? Is there anything, any web, any rope, any thread, the thread is better, any thread that pulls them together. And this is what the Lord showed me. There was one thing present with the man at the pool of Siloam, one thing present with the man that was at Pesedo, and one man, one thing present with the other one, three blind, sounds like a song, three blind men, see how they're healed. Listen, there was one thing, no externals, but one thing was there. 
that must be there. If you're going to have healing, oh, it's got to be, got to be some catechism that I've got to learn. Nope. Got to give my offerings, my tithes. Nope. Nope. One thing present in all three instances, here it is, Jesus was there. And he is the common denominator in all of your sicknesses and all of your problems. If you need it, it comes by way of Calvary. To heal your diseases and to heal your diseases, whatever they are. Now I'm gonna tell you that I've already talked to him today, early this morning, before the crack of dawn. And I've talked to him in this place today and I know he's here. He's here because you're here and your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. So if he's here, we're gonna ask him for healings right now. You say, but I, I don't come from church like this. I don't care if you didn't come from any church. Might be a temple, it might be a brush arbor. It doesn't matter to me. Maybe a Baptist, it may be a Catholic. I don't care. Can he do it for me? The man went. Jesus was there. The man didn't get healed until Jesus came. The man at Jericho didn't get healed until Jesus came. The man at Bethsaida didn't get healed until Jesus came. Then Jesus came and made the darkness flee. Yours is going to come the same way. Don't you worry about what anybody else does or says. But right now, I'm going to ask you in an unconventional way. Do you really believe that God can heal? If you do, let me see your hand raised up. All right. If you really believe that God will heal you and you're sick, I've got a thing here with 75 names on it. Some of you are in church today. Some of you are out there listening to me right now. Some of you are on the hill. I know you are. We're going to pray for you, and we're going to pray for this man who's, who's facing death. We've got to pray for him, Eddie, right now. And we're going to pray in an unconventional way. We're going to believe God, because God is here. I want you to say it with me. Come on. God is here. Will you say it with me? The presence of Jesus is here. And I want to hear you say it. Jesus Christ has already totally defeated Satan. Now, if you came and you need healing, I want you to stand on your feet right now. All over the house. Don't wait for somebody else. I want you to stand and say, is anybody else? It doesn't matter if it's one. It doesn't matter. Now we're going to see some healings. Now I've asked several people here, and I surely want to include every person who's an elder, every person who's a staff person, every person who's a, an administrator, every person who's a leader. I want you to see somebody standing. I want you to go to where they are, if you really believe it. But listen. Don't, don't negate their faith. If you don't believe it, don't go. But if you believe that God will heal, I want you to go and I want you to stand there with them right now. Some of the others of you, I want you to do it. And I saw some of you over here, over here. Pastors, all, you find somebody all, all around. How many of you that are standing can say, Pastor, nobody's come to me yet. Let me see your hand. Way back over in the back over there. Somebody's coming right now. Stand with them. Somebody just passed you by, okay? I want somebody to go and stand with that couple way back over those people right over there. That's Bridget. If you believe God, I want you to go and stand with them, okay? How many people now have not had anybody stand with them? Let me see your hand. Okay, anybody else? 
It's difficult to see with these lights like this. Way back in the back, I see a hand way back there. Somebody go, who's a Bible believer here? I want you to go and stand by that person. There's somebody going right now, okay? Is there anybody else? Now, I want everybody in this house to stand on your feet right now and reverence God, okay? I want you to have everything out of your mind, your microwave oven, your turkey, chicken, whatever it might be. I want you to begin to pray right now. And I want you to believe God. Now, I, I uh, Larry Anderson, Mr. Anderson, I want you to come up here wherever you are in the place. I want you to come up here and stand with me right here. Come right on down, that's right, fast as you can make it. And we're gonna pray that God is gonna to touch you and heal you in Jesus' name. That's unconventional, it's all right. Why don't you take that mic right there, this one, whichever one. See if you got the juice on that one. You don't have to do it, just talk. Is it in the on? name of Jesus. Okay. Yes. Now I want you who are standing there, don't just stand there, listen to me now. Don't just stand there and go. I want you to pray. If you don't know how to pray, you can say one word, Jesus. Everybody say it, come on, Jesus. Again, come on, Jesus. One more time, Jesus. You don't have to be afraid of it, okay? Say it out loud, everybody. Jesus. Do it like Bartimaeus did. Come on. Jesus. 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 I forgot the choir. Is there somebody here? Are we covered up here? Okay. Now, we're going to pray that God's going to touch you and heal your body in Jesus' name. And I want you to start praying. Don't let him just pray. We're gonna get in touch with God right now. And I want you to reach and, and, and pray for that person and claim healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lead us out, brother. Lord Jesus. Just a second, okay? Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we come this morning to say thank you. Good. Thank you. Ah, your spirit is so strong in this place this morning. Lord Jesus, we just plead your blood right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody need you this morning, oh God, and they've been calling on you all night long. God, we know that you are the hearer of prayers, oh God, and that you hear the call of your children. So touch right now in the name of Jesus. God, we need you right now. You brought Elizabeth all the way from Maryland, oh God, and just as an example of your miracle touch, oh God. So touch right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody needs you, oh God, to heal them from cancer, oh God. God, you heal the woman in the Bible, oh Lord, who touched the hem of your garment, oh God. Let me feel your touch this morning, oh God. God, we thank you for what you're about to do this morning, oh Lord. You're about to make witnesses out of everyone here, oh God, who has a need. You said in your word, oh Lord, that we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So touch right now in the name of Jesus. Look at how we've come this morning, oh Lord. We come, oh God, touching each other and holding hands, oh Lord. Our hearts are crying out unto you, oh Lord. Touch right now in the name of Jesus. God, we need you right now. We need an unconventional touch this morning. We need you to heal us this morning, oh God. If you heal us, God, we will not be quiet about your healing. We'll tell everyone, oh God, how you healed us, oh God. We bless you this morning in the name of Jesus. Touch, oh Father God, and heal right now in the name of Jesus. Not only in this sanctuary, oh God, but there are those out on the hill in their automobiles who's calling on your name. And God, I ask that you'll just move from, from car to car, oh Lord. Move from automobile to automobile. Touch right now, God, in the Cape Fear Valley Hospital. Touch, oh God, at Duke and UNC, oh Lord. Touch at Rex Hospital, oh God. Stand right there in the room, oh God, and touch somebody in the name of Jesus. God, we love you this morning and we bless your holy name. We lift you up, oh Lord. 
You said in your word to call for the elders of the church, O oh Lord, and let them lay hands on the sick, O oh God, and the prayer of the righteous will avail much. And so, God, we're asking you right now just to heal all around this sanctuary. Somebody needs you this morning, O oh Lord, and somebody needs you to heal their, their aching body, O oh God. Stretch out your hand right now, oh Father God. God, somebody's coming here on faith, oh God. They, they're needing you to strengthen their faith this morning. Not only in a physical way, oh God, but in a mental way, oh God. I pray, oh God, that you will cast off depression, oh God. Cast depression away from the family, oh Lord. There are some people here who, some mother calling on the name of Jesus for a child. God, you've seen the tears in the midnight hour. And I'm asking you, God, just to touch right now in the name of Jesus. Heal that child, oh God. Strengthen that child's faith right now in the name of Jesus. God, we receive your healing right now. Touch right now in the name of Jesus, oh God. Cast depression away from that child, oh Lord. Cast suicidal thoughts away from that child this morning in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that you would cast out pornography out of our families, oh Lord. Cast out alcoholism, oh Lord. Cast out the oxycodone, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Cast out the indifference, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, we need your touch this morning. Touch us, oh God, like we've never been touched before. Thank God those are those are at the hospitals this morning. Touch our doctors, oh God, and strengthen their faith. Touch the nurses and strengthen their faith. The deputies, oh God, the policemen, oh God, the firemen, oh God, the politicians, oh God. Strengthen their faith in you, oh Lord. God, we bless you this morning. We honor you this morning. Now all across this building, oh God, we lift our hands in victory, oh God. We lift our hands, oh God, and say thank you, Jesus. We open up our mouths and we say thank you, Jesus. We praise your God for what you have done here today. We praise your God for the healing, oh Lord. We praise your God for the anointing, oh God. We praise your God for the strengthening of the family. We praise your God because you are great and you are greatly to be praised. We thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Lord Jesus. Come on, everyone, lift up your voice and praise. Come on, lift up your voice and praise. Lord Jesus. It was your blood, Jesus. It was your blood. Your blood, Jesus. Sing it all. The blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. His salvation, His deliverance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. The blood of Jesus. It was Offering, come on. Hallelujah. Give him a praise offering. Hallelujah. In the cars, come on. In the cars up on the hill. Praise the Lord in your car, in your truck. Come on. Praise him on that place up there. It's a praise place. It's a hill of the Lord. Praise him in your home. Praise him on your bed right now. Come on. Praise him on your praise him on your couch. In your chair. In your car. Come on. Pastor, I believe, because I'm going on the word of the Lord, I can, I will, I do believe that God has touched me today. Let me see your hand. While your hand is up, Father, we speak, not only for those for whom we pray today, but we speak for Eddie right now. Eddie, in the name of Jesus, may your lungs be healed. I speak to your oxygen. I speak it from the 65, that it will grow to 75, even now, and 85, and 95. Be rejuvenated in spirit right now. Be alive. 
and for your wife and family. God, for those in this congregation that are sick, thank you, Lord, for touching. I thank you, Lord, for the way that you've touched and you brought it and made it just right. I had no idea, Lord, you'd bring it like this to bring Elizabeth here today. But, Lord, may her light shine. May we do the works of the Father because it's daytime right now. The night cometh when no man can work. Listen, folks. We had not got time to split hairs over anything. Jesus.